So anyway, scale up means <laughs> student-centered active learning environment with upside down pedagogies. And uh, the ironic thing is I'm gonna spend the next <laughs> I'm gonna say, spend the next ten minutes or so lecturing to you about how to avoid lecturing. Uh, this is a, uh, a teaching approach that was developed at NC State, uh, but it is now spread uh, to more than 150 places around the country. Um, and just so you know, the U and the P initially meant university physics, but it's now, now no longer just at the university level, it's at middle and high school level, and it's serving no longer just in physics, so we had to change the name. And actually, the, uh, the L and the E originally stood for large enrollment. Uh, and so the scaling up was taking um, research-based pedagogies that had been proven to work with classes of 15 or 20 and finding ways to make them work with classes of 100 or more. And in fact, the largest installation that, uh, is now looking for 180 students. Uh, but this, this works, it seems to work at multiple levels. You can see what the classroom looks like. It's, uh, this is an example of one, one classroom. This is at MIT. Uh, but uh, if you remember back to Mr. Malik's classroom where there were stations, uh, we've got tables. And there's nine students at each table, and they are working on different things. So let, let's go through the name in detail, because I think it'll give you some idea of what this is all about. Uh, and the, and the, the overall goals are to develop those survival skills that you saw uh, listed earlier on by, uh, by Sophie. So it's student-centered. Uh, if you were to put a webcam you know, on, the, on each student's head and look at what each student was looking at, you would discover that almost all the time they are looking at other students. When, there's, when you are seated at a round table and you're looking straight forward, you are looking at the students from across the table. So it really is student-centered. Um, the students are put into collaborative teams. These are actually really carefully formed. Uh, we don't tell the students this, but each team of three students has someone from the top, the middle, and the bottom of the class. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one reason for getting the, the people in the bottom of the class in a group like this is because this may be the first time they've ever worked with a top student. And they are shocked to discover that they actually study a week in advance for a test. That never would have occurred to them. They've never seen it before. Um, it, turns, it turns out the students at the, at the high end also benefit greatly from a, a diverse group like that because they spend a lot of their time teaching the others. And we have a lot of research that shows that those students are actually the ones that gain the most from this experience. In fact, it's, it's most pronounced at MIT, and when you think about it, the top students at MIT are probably the best students in the whole world. They gain more than anyone else when they are teaching their peers, and when we compare it to when they were in a lecture class, they learned less than anyone else, because they probably already knew most of the things that were being presented in the lecture. Then they get opportunities to, uh, to present their work to each other, critique each other's work, things like that. Um, it's also an active learning space. We have them working on activities almost all the time. Uh, things called tangibles, which are hands-on measurements and observations. Uh, for example, they have little um, aluminum name blocks. And one of the tasks, um, actually just this past week, one of the tasks was you hold that name block in your hand for as long as it takes to get it up to your hand temperature. What was the power output of your hand? Um, uh, ponderables are interesting questions. So, uh, for example, I've, I've heard of a political science teacher who has their students um, take a current event of the day, like maybe the, the, the microphone problem that, that the president had recently. And, and each table has three teams, A, B, and C. So all the A teams go to the web and find out how Fox News covered President Obama being picked up on an open mic. All the B teams go to MSNBC and see how that was covered. And the C teams go to the BBC and see if it was covered. And yourself how, and then compare those and see how they're different. See how the things that are presented in, in both or in all three actually are presented differently. See how see what things are left out, what things are emphasized, and then take some other current event. Doesn't matter what. Scour the web, learn as much about it as you can, and then pretend you're working for one of those media outlets and write the story and give it to someone else and see if they can figure out who you work for. <coughs> so it's an opportunity to do some things. <laughs> Uh, the environment is actually critically important, we've discovered. We, we did research over a whole semester on four different table sizes. Just to get out round tables where the, where the way to go. We then tried four different sizes and actually would station students at tables. We would videotape them, have observers do things like that, have focus groups, then move them to a different size table and a different size and a different size. So I tell people that the tables are actually the most important technology in the room. 
because technology is a designed solution to a particular problem. It doesn't have to plug in. Uh, and we are, as I, oops, as I mentioned, we have to, when I have to mess this up, here we go, I'll be back through here one more time. And, oops, once more, there we go. We have three teams of three students, as I mentioned. There are whiteboards around the room as sort of public thinking spaces, so they do their work up there, and, and, you know, and then my job is to roam around and start fights. <laughs> <laughs> Their number is a lot different than yours. Is it different enough to worry about? And then I leave and let them decide, well, first of all, is it different enough to worry about? And if it is, who's right? And, and, and also, there is a lot of technology. There's a, there's a computer, a laptop computer for every uh, group of students, at least. And then finally, this upside down pedagogy thing. Um, there, you may have heard of the flipped classroom, the Khan Academy, things like that. The basic idea is that things that used to happen in the classroom, like content delivery, like I'm doing right now, don't need to happen in the classroom anymore. You can, if, if, a, if a teacher is saying something over and over and over again every year, put it in a can. Let the students get that outside of class by, as a multimedia or something. Or maybe even reading the book. Who knows? But there's no reason to waste class time because class time is when you've got an expert there and you've got all your peers to help. So that's the place that you do the really hard stuff. And so it's switched what's happened. That's what the flip classroom is all about. But also, it's, ours is upside down because the students become teachers, because they do teach each other. And in fact, we put them in situations where they have to. Each person in the team gets a particular piece of information that's, that's necessary for the whole team to succeed. So they have to share that and, and teach each other. And then finally, the design of instruction is upside down as well. We start with performance outcomes. What do you want students to be able to do at the end of class? Not understand, nobody knows what the word understand means, but what can they do, or what should they be able to do? Once you figure that out, then it's pretty easy to develop assessments. Basically, you ask them to do those things. And once you have that figured out, then you design instruction, which is what kind of experiences do we have to have students working on to develop the skills to allow them to do those things that we have decided are important. So the name actually has as everything uh, packed pretty tightly. The, the difficulty, of course, and I guess we really don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but students aren't learning as much as they'd like. We already know that. Uh, here's the scary one. Only 21% of 12th graders scored proficient in, uh, this was on a sample this, or a test that was uh, released just recently, <coughs> this last year, and identifying the difference between a star and a planet is a way to demonstrate proficiency. And only about one in five of our to do that. And of course, it isn't just the high schools that are the problem. Um, you may have heard about this report that came out last year as well. After four years, um, more than a third of the students in, in college do not really demonstrate any gain in critical thinking skills and can write and things like that. So that's a real problem. Uh, another difficulty is that students are more, I'll use the phrase, intellectually diverse. Okay, which means it's broader. They're broader than it used to be. Back in the dark ages, when I graduated from high school, less than half of students went on to college. Now it's more than two-thirds. So that 20%, what do you do with them? Well, we used to just fail, but we can't afford to do that anymore. Okay. But we certainly don't want to lower our standards either, because that would really confuse the issue. So we have to find a way to help those folks along. So students are more diverse than we would like them to be. And that's a problem. And of course, you know, there's this is from the uh, State of the Union uh, just uh, a couple months ago. There will be twice as many openings as we have workers in STEM jobs. Um, you know, this, the STEM areas are expected to grow a lot. This is from the U.S. Department of Commerce. And here, even in North Carolina, we're looking at a huge increase in STEM jobs. So clearly, it's something we have to address. And the problem, of course, is that students are very different than they used to be. They're digital natives. They grew up with technology. They grew up, they've been using Google since they first learned to read. That has to change. That has to change students, and it does certainly. Uh, information is, in, is now ubiquitous. I did a search on uh, on the word Google and got almost 12 billion hits, <laughs> and it took less than a tenth of a second to do that. So there's no need for a teacher to be standing giving information to students because they can get it off the web. They need to be able to assess whether it's real or not. Uh, we don't want to waste people's talents. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a 1924 computer room. <laughs> it's the Veterans Bureau, and the computers are, are calculating veterans' benefits. The interesting thing is that the computers are not the ad machines. The computers are the women that are running the ad machines. That's what their job title said. But we don't do that anymore. I mean, it's a real waste of people's skills. 
And same thing, if someone is just standing in the front and lecturing, they can be replaced by an iPod, and they probably should be. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, we should be doing things like Socrates, asking questions, getting the students to think. Uh, luckily, we've got this. This is our trunk, what I like to call our trunk card. This is the most frequently cited uh, piece of research in all of higher education, and it answers the question of what matters in college. They just characterize students, they survey them, ask them every question you could think of, and then just did a correlation to connect to student success. The one thing that matters most, relationships. If there's somebody who cares about how you do, you tend to do better. Well, that's what this kind of classroom that I've been talking about permits us to let happen. These people get to know each other. I've got a class of 100 students, I know every student's name. Now everybody's got a name tag, so that short helps a lot. <laughs> But you do get to know the students very well. Uh, so there's lots and lots of schools doing this all over the world, actually. This is in Hebrew, it's a little hard to read. Um, but it's, it's growing rapidly, and hopefully with Tony's help, we'll be getting this out into more schools here in, in the state and high schools. We've got loads of data. Uh, the, all these things have been demonstrated. Um, uh, I did, I, yeah, retention is much higher. I have data from 16,000 students. Failure rates drop by a factor of three even though our standards are raised. And in fact, for, for African Americans, it dropped by a factor of four, and for women, it dropped by a factor of five. Okay. Even though we demand more of the students. So anyway, if you want more information about this, here's my email, and you can also just check out our website uh, to get some information about that. <laughs>